Oh, hello there. You must be a new face. If you're wondering what or who I'm dressed as today, well, I recently cosplayed Roderica and I got a lot of comments asking me to cover her friend, Smithing Master Hugh. And I promised that I would, so let's embark on a tale of resilience, sacrifice and fate as we explore the indomitable Smith. Speaking of indomitable, before we start this story, I'm thrilled to announce that this video is sponsored by Display, of one of a kind metal posters that display what you love. We know the importance of surrounding ourselves with things that inspire us and reflect what we are passionate about. That's what makes Display so special. They have over 1 million designs, including official brands like Netflix, Marvel, NASA, as well as plenty of games like Dark Souls and Elden Ring. I personally love these Disco Elysium ones, as well as this Bloodborne art by Fine Tees from their Good Hunter collection. The print quality and detail of the metal is absolutely amazing, and each one is approved and signed by their master of production. They are durable enough to withstand a lifetime of being stared at, even by eyes cursed by the flavour frenzy. Simply wipe your wall with the cleaning wipe, stick down the protective leaf, attach the magnet on top, and your display will be attached instantly to your wall. They deliver worldwide in only four to five business days. Display carefully packs your design so they arrive safely and securely. So if this sounds like something that you want to start collecting, I'm excited to offer you an exclusive discount on your order. If you use my code CHALICE or click the link in the description, you'll get 20% off your order if you purchase one to two displays, or if you do three or more, you'll get 30% off. Just click the link in the description or the pinned comment below. Thank you so much again to Displate, and now let's get into today's lore. Baldwin the jovial and eager, Andre the gruff and humble, Lenny Grass the world weary and paternal. The character of the blacksmith has always been essential in our soul's adventures. They help us get stronger, refine our weapons and armour, but also their personalities are probably what we remember the most. All of them are unique and skilled at what they do, but their most important attribute is their unwavering dedication to their craft. All of them are the embodiment of perseverance, a beacon of hope in each dark and despairing universe. And in Elden Ring, Master Hugh is no exception. Hugh resides in the Round Table Hold, the main hub, and can be found there on your very first time visiting. It's not much for small talk, getting to work on smithing our gear immediately. Now, you may have been startled at first by Hugh's appearance. He resembles that of a man, but is scaled, fanged and horned, much like another species we can find in the game, the misbegotten. Oppressed beings, perceived as feral and hostile, but they possess a complexity beyond their initial appearance. The word misbegotten translates into three different and significant definitions. The first, badly made or badly designed. There are subtypes of misbegotten, slight differences in each of their physical attributes. Some have tails, others have wings, some covered with hard scales, and others with shocks of red hair. Each of these attributes make up the schema of the misbegotten, those seen as impure. But why have these specific attributes become so despised? Let's take the old fang as an example. Multiple overlapping fangs grow from a single root. Perhaps they're a vestige of the primordial crucible. These old fangs drop from the misbegotten and are now a functionless part of their anatomy, hence the word old. But its purpose is not the thing in question which is so negatively perceived but what it symbolises, something called the Crucible, an entity representing the power of creation, an ancient force that predated the Golden Order, primordial crucible where all life was once blended together. At the beginning of time, these tails, wings and horns were all part of the typical anatomy you could find in any organism, but as civilization advanced, this blessing of the divine was now viewed as an impurity instead. This most likely began when the Golden Order was founded. Primal, bestial, primitive things are the total opposite of what the Golden Order stands for. So the misbegotten are unfairly punished for existing, discriminated against. Their appearance is an offensive reminder that they are considered less evolved. Which brings us to the second definition of misbegotten. 
a vulgar word used as a term of contempt and abuse, you despicable, accursed creature. And that's putting it nicely. Because they are so despised, this is why some of the misbegotten are also disfigured, horns cut off, maiming them, all because they bear characteristics of the crucible. This is possibly why Hugh also has these stumps on his head, most likely the aftermath of his horns being cut off. I asked one of my favourite Souls creators, Ziofsky, if they could provide some high quality captures of Hugh's character model. Here you can see, especially on his back, a clear view of what naturally occurs on the bodies of the misbegotten, endlessly sprouting horns, and in comparison here, in these darker areas, the bone or keratin has been sawed through, only an open stump remaining. As it appears culturally acceptable to mutilate the misbegotten, this somehow gave justification to the people of the lands between that these beings were submissive and that they could be used for their own benefit. The misbegotten are held to be a punishment for making contact with the crucible, and from birth they are treated as slaves or worse. Hugh is no exception to this, he is also a slave, foot shackled and chained to the wall of the round table hold. I see you've noticed the chains. Nothing special. I'm a prisoner and these are my chains. I'm trapped by the hold. I'm dying, smithing for you fools. Pressing Hugh further for this results in a very level-headed reaction. It has been this way for so long that he is now used to it. My being a prisoner is no fault of yours. Besides, I don't mind smithing. However, not all misbegotten are so calm about this caste system. We see this at Castle Morn, now overrun by misbegotten who had grown tired of being enslaved. They rebelled, driving out the inhabitants and slaughtering any who remained. Irina refers to them as servants. The servants there have rebelled. But as we discover, Irina has poor eyesight. It's unlikely that she knows what the misbegotten actually look like. And in a way, her blindness makes her unbiased. She cannot make an appearance-based judgement about something which she cannot see. Hence why she talks about the misbegotten in a much more respectful way than that of her father. The menials have all rebelled. They gave me good service, or so I thought. But it seems it was all an act. Foul creatures, as it said, and true enough, they're foul inside and out. This is the true nature of man in the lands between. The last definition is the most interesting. Misbegotten can mean illegitimate, as in an illegitimate child, a bastard child. But if this is the case, then who are the misbegotten children of exactly? The port for this theory lies in their internal character name. The designated invisible ID given to NPCs and enemies as a label for the devs to use in the back end. The one given to the misbegotten is actually Chimera. A Chimera, in short, is a mythological living amalgamation of animal parts. But the definition is not the important part per se, it's the word itself. There was a line in an item description for the winged misbegotten that was actually changed upon release. In the present patch, it reads, used to summon the spirit of a winged misbegotten. But before, in the 1.0 build of the game, it read, summons the spirit of Radigan's Chimera. The use of the possessive noun of Radigan's might imply that these are Radigan's children. This theory would also be supported by the literal translation of the Japanese text. Instead of using any one of the previously discussed variants of the word misbegotten, Instead, they are called Zashu. This translates to hybrid or half-breed, so could it be that Radigan somehow reproduced with someone or something, resulting in half-breed children? I mentioned earlier that there exists a type of misbegotten with a particular feature in common with Radigan, the red hair. And I completely realise that red hair doesn't necessarily mean there has to be a direct correlation to Radigan, but colour is so important in this game, specifically what red symbolises. 
The red hair of the giants, the red wolf of Radigan, the red manes, all of these in some way are connected to Radigan, the curse and symbolism of his red hair. And I don't think that it is purely coincidental that some of the misbegotten warriors also have red hair. This theory is cemented with one of the misbegotten bosses, Leonine, another misbegotten with that same red hair. And Leonine means lion-like. And would you believe it that another character in the game also has red hair and commonly uses a lion motif? And that is Radan. Radan inherited the furious flaming red hair of his father Radigan and is fond of its heroic implications. I was born a champion's cub, now I am lord of the battlefield's lion. Radan is Radigan's son, a lion-like, red-haired child of Radigan, just like Leonine Misbegotten. Not to mention that a chimera is most commonly represented with a head of a lion. However, Leonine did not get that glory, honour and royalty that Radan did. Because of the Golden Order, led by Marika. If the Misbegotten are indeed Radigan's bastard children, then it makes sense why Queen Marika would treat them with such disdain. She would not want these impure offspring of her now husband having anything to do with her or her reign. I would recommend Sekiro Doobie's fascinating video on the game data of the Misbegotten and their connection to Radigan, if you're interested in more of this theory. So now we have established the Misbegotten's role in the Lands Between, their hatred, their resentment and their subservience to Marika, we can keep that in mind when analysing Hugh's character and background, something he is very aware of. Despite my differences, the weapons get stronger all the same. Given time, technique never fails. Besides, it helps me forget. The sheer terror of her. Her, presumably being Marika. Hugh's rough, walled psyche cracks. He is terrified of her. One point when we return to the round table hold, we see Hugh on his knees, elbows resting on his anvil, in desperate prayer. The road is yet long, a god is not easily felled. But one day without fail you will have your wish. So please grant me forgiveness, Queen Marika. This is surprisingly vulnerable for Hugh, walking in on a private moment, beseeching forgiveness from Marika. Hugh refuses to elaborate on the words of his prayer. Those words were not meant for you. I may be prisoner to you, tarnished lot, but my prayers are mine, and mine alone. This is within his right. After all, he is still a being that deserves our respect. However, if we analyse the words of the prayer, we get an idea as to why Hugh is imprisoned here. A god is not easily felled, but one day without fail you will have your wish. Hugh is kept prisoner by his anvil so that he can make a weapon to fell this god in question. Such a weapon is surely hard to come by, even more so to create from scratch. Marika must have seen Hugh's potential, recognising that he could be responsible to successfully complete this challenging task. Or maybe not. Perhaps she thought that anyone could do so, if given enough time. If given eternity. I'm trapped by the hold. I'm dying, smithing for you fools. <laughs> Hugh cannot die, cannot escape. He is stuck. He has no option but to try over and over again to smith this weapon. Marika has forced Hugh to complete this. No sweet release of death, no rest until it is done. And by the looks of our blacksmith, he has been doing this a while. How long has he been banging that hammer? How long has he been stuck here at the round table hold? We cannot know, but we can see that it is starting to get to him. No, 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 no. I need to do better than this. This will never kill a god. I can do better than this. It needs to slay a bloody god. Hugh's desperation could either be due to his burning desire for freedom 
granted when completing this task, or he may share Marika's wish for this god to be felled. But who is this god, I hear you ask? Well, it might actually be Marika herself. Let me explain. Marika is of godhood. Queen Marika is the vessel of the Elden Ring, carrier of its vision. A god in truth. Now why would Marika want to be destroyed? To do so, we need to speculate a bit about the events that took place before the beginning of the game. It is said that long ago, the Greater Will sent a golden star bearing a beast into the lands between, which would later become the Elden Ring. It was the vassal beast of the Greater Will and the living incarnation of the concept of order. This, of course, is the item description we received from felling the Elden Beast, the last boss of the game. And Marika was bestowed godhood and the responsibility to be the vessel for this beast. She did so because she wanted to understand more about this great divine concept that had suddenly arrived into her world. In Marika's own words, I declare mine intent to search the depths of the Golden Order through understanding of the proper way. Our faith, our grace is increased. But Marika realized something along the way, the truth about the Golden Order's vision. Whether this was due to her son Godwin dying or something else, it culminated in her taking up a hammer and smashing it into the Elden Ring. She clearly wanted no part to bear this burden any longer, but she failed to destroy it. And as a result, Marika was imprisoned inside of the Erd Tree. Marika's trespass demanded a heavy sentence. But even in shackles, she remains a god and a vision's vessel. So there must have been a point in the timeline, pre-shattering and pre-imprisonment, that Marika formulated this plan. It must have been here that she asked Hugh to make the weapon kill a god, kill her, and as a result, kill the Elden Beast inside of her, free the lands between, stop the cycle. How much she told Hugh about this is not known, but what she did divulge made Hugh terrified, whether in the form of a threat to him if he didn't comply, or the gravity that the whole of human existence weighed on his shoulders to craft a solution to the stagnation. Marika's words chilled him to the bone. We will return to Marika and her end goal later in this video, but for now we will touch on the main character who managed to thaw and warm Hugh's heart. The introduction of Roderica to the Round Table Hold has an interesting effect on Master Hugh. He sees potential within her, and we encourage him to train her, but he strongly protests. Are you out of your mind? Who'd stay with an ugly brute who only knows how to smith? Here we can see the effects of years of misbegotten discrimination. He thinks himself lowly and disgusting. He refuses to allow himself to even get close to Roderica out of fear of hurting himself. I don't doubt you, but I know when something's too good to be true. Roderica and her good nature win him over. But more so than that, a physical attribute of hers. I saw another one like her long ago. Their eyes share the same hue. Hugh recognizes her innate gift for spirit tuning and draws similarity to another individual who possessed a similar ability, someone with the same eyes. So what exactly is the hue of Roderica's eyes? It looks like part green, part blue, the highlights being seafoam green and the shadows resembling a dark teal. Do we know any other characters in the game who share a similar eye colour? Well, there is a character called Rico, who was actually cut from the release version of the game, that does have these same bright green eyes. However, he refers to himself as a male, and the one who Hugh refers to is a she. Rico also has nothing to do with spirit tuning, so it's more than certain to not be him. The closest match to Roderica's eye colour could be Rani's. Her eyes are definitely more blue than green, emphasised more so by their glowing nature. But if you were to glance at both of them from afar, maybe you would remember their similar striking nature. 
Rani's affinity for spirits and bestowing you with the ability to summon them also adds weight to this connection. However, just because you are able to summon spirits doesn't necessarily mean you are able to tune them, empower them. That is something that only Roderica and this mystery person can do. There is nothing linking Hugh and Rani together, apart from the tenuous link to her eye colour. If Hugh was close to and spent a lot of time with this mystery person, it's unlikely that he would misremember the colour of their eyes. I think it's safe to assume that there is no relation between Rani and the eye colour in question. No dialogue, no item description to connect her and Hugh. Hugh's old friend is a character unknown to us. Plus, the fact that he refers to honouring her, as in honouring the dead, it would imply that this spirit tuner is presumably long, long gone from this world. Which is why Hugh cannot help but become attached to Roderica. She has the same eyes, the same talents as his former close friend. It's enough to pierce the stony hide of his heart. But his gentle disposition for Roderica doesn't necessarily fade when speaking to us. Hugh begins to speak more about his and our purpose, how our fates are entwined. Might I have a word then? Your kind are meant to challenge them, to slay them, the demigods and their god. If you remain loyal to your calling, then no matter what you do, no matter what happens to me, I will never cease to smith your weapons until you have one to slay a god. This particular dialogue occurs when you decline Melina's offer at first to burn the Erd Tree and then return to the Round Table Hold. Hugh needs you to proceed. See, it doesn't matter if Hugh finally completes the god slaying weapon, he needs you to be the one to wield it. You are meant to kill the demigods, to gain their runes to become more powerful. Marika wants you to defeat her children. Her children warred, but none could become Elden Lord. And so grace was extended to your kind, the Tarnished. Marika didn't particularly care about who would be the next Elden Lord, she just needed them to be strong enough. She even warned her children, the demigods, about this. Melina tells us Marika's exact words. Hear me, demigods. My children, beloved, make of thyselves that which he desire. Be it a lord, be it a god. But should ye fail to become aught at all, ye will be forsaken amounting only to sacrifices. What she is saying here is that to try, to fight, to become strong, do something, because if you don't do anything, you will be fodder for us, the tarnished one, to consume. But the demigods didn't listen. They were too busy rebelling or vying for power amongst themselves. That is why Merica blessed us with the ability to see grace to lead us all around the lands between, growing stronger with every battle, every fallen child, until we are strong enough to approach her prison and end it all. That is what Hugh means when he says you are meant to slay them. This is something we must do and he must be the one to help us. And his determination never wavers, not for anything. You strive onwards, you set fire to the Erd Tree and continue on the path to the final boss. But as flames engulf the tree, they also engulf the round table. Hold. All the tarnished who once gathered here are now absent or deceased. Apart from Roderick and Hugh, the former begging for Hugh to escape. His shackles are broken. He's a free man now. It's high time he put the round table behind him. The foundations of the hub are breaking, and with it, so are Hugh's chains. So surely they will be able to leave now. Weren't you listening? As I've always said, you came to challenge the demigods and their god to slay them. And as long as you do, I will always smith your weapons. It is what I wish. To smith a weapon for you to slay a god. Hugh wants to stay. At this point, he has still not completed that special weapon. 
so despite his physical restraints having been broken, his metaphorical ones are still in place. He will continue to plunge iron into the flames of his forge, despite the flames of ruin engulfing his prison. The weapon itself that Hugh has been working on is not one weapon in particular. It can actually be any weapon that you are able to wield. As long as you upgrade it to max level, that will be considered the god slaying weapon. The ancient dragon smithing stone is the upgrade material you need to advance to this level of refinement, and its description even references this. This stone lightly twists time, allowing the creation of a weapon capable of slaying a god. This is a nice way of incorporating whatever playstyle, build or weapon you have chosen to be recognised as worthy. That's not to say that if you don't upgrade a weapon to max, then you can't complete the game. You still will be able to, but you will miss out on Hugh's special dialogue. This will happen when you reach plus 25 on a normal weapon or plus 10 on a special weapon. You will receive your powerful weapon as a reward, and Hugh will be rewarded with closure, having completed his final work. Yes, I'm my masterpiece to slay a god. That's all I've lived for. And my promise to Queen And my promise to Queen Marika. He stumbles on Marika's name, the weight of this task easing and his curse lifting. in the way of the, the, the round table. It was a crayon. A crayon that smith your weapons during my time here. Allow me to call, call, call you this just once before it ends. My lord. You are. There is something so bittersweet about these words, the gruff, hard-headed blacksmith, now completely unshielded, emotional and humble, and at this time, acquiescing himself to us, but willingly, not because he is a subservient misbegotten and we are tarnished, but because he wants to serve us, serve his lord. We have earned his respect and honour. We granted him his freedom. He's fulfilled his purpose. Almost. After completing Faram Azula and returning to the Round Table Hold, you will find that the fire and smoke have grown worse. No one remains, apart from those two same individuals, Roderica and Hugh. Who are you? Oh. I must be a blacksmith. Now, let's go smithing. As he speaks, a sickening feeling gathers in the pit of your stomach. Hugh has forgotten you. His memory has faded. He no longer recognises us, no longer understands what is happening in the world. He doesn't even remember his newly appointed daughter. Could you tell me what happened? Why is the round table burning? ruins. Why does that girl weep for me? Oh. <laughs> Have I forgotten something of dire importance? Despite having such bright eyes, they can no longer spark any recognition in the mind of our beloved blacksmith. All he can do is look down and at the anvil, hammer and pile of weapons around him and presume that he must be a blacksmith and without further delay, he picks up his trusty tool and gets back to work. Why does Hugh lose his memory exactly? I've seen a couple of people posit that Hugh possibly has some form of dementia, more common in older individuals, symptomised by a loss of cognitive function, including memory loss. A piece of evidence used to support this theory is the fact that Hugh's common greeting to us is I took you for dead. The joke being that you would walk away for a second and Hugh has already presumed you perished due to his deteriorating time and depth perception, this being an early telltale sign 
that his dementia would only worsen from here on. However, as an alternative theory, this dialogue might be interpreted instead as sarcasm, a dry joke along the lines of, oh, it's you, I haven't seen you in so long, I thought something happened to you. In fact, Lenny Grast, a blacksmith in Dark Souls 2, utters an eerily similar greeting. Oh, I'd given you up for dead. Almost had me worried, really. It's likely that Lenny Grast and Hugh are both making an off-the-cuff comment. So another possible reason for why Hugh forgets is because somehow his being is intrinsically linked to the round table hold, and because that is slowly burning away, so is Hugh's existence. Roderica comments that his roots are so knotted in this place, and Hugh himself says, I'm going the way of the round table, as in, he will soon be nothing if the round table hold will disintegrate into ashes. So it's possible that as the hub ceases to exist, so does Hugh's mental state. But instead of taking advantage of Hugh's failing memory, Roderica proposes that we should let him stay. When he was more sound of mind, he was adamant that freedom meant nothing to him anymore. Won't you survive for freedom now? Are smith weapons to slay a god? I have lived and will die doing so upon this spot. Is there any other way? So we should respect Hugh wants to die for his cause, crafting this god-slaying weapon for us, and we should honour him by finally using it. As we enter the Erd Tree for the final battle, we see the reality of America's imprisonment. Strung up, frozen, skin cracked like China, the evidence of her trying to shatter the Elden Ring on her own body. Marika then transforms into Radigan, her other half. They inhabit the same body, but their minds and souls are separate. But what is important to remember here is that because they share the same body, that is our target. That is where the Elden Ring is kept, and by extension, the Elden Beast. That is what we should use our god slaying weapon on. And when Radigan is felled, so is Marika and the vassal of the greater will reveals itself to us. And when it is defeated, this is where you have the choice as to your ending. But pretty much all of them show us taking the broken head of Marika and placing it back on her shoulders. It's my belief that Marika is no longer alive, but she still remains an inanimate vessel for the Elden Ring. We can see the shell of her body glow as the Elden Ring is repaired. This is the Age of Fracture referring to Marika's fractured state, her body is still used to supply the Elden Ring's influence over the lands between, but as for her consciousness and autonomy, that's ambiguous. Placing her head back on her shoulders, I believe, is more of a symbolic last gesture than rather physically rebuilding her body. This would be supported by the weapon we receive as the game's final reward, the Sacred Relic Sword wrought from the remains of a god who should have lived a life eternal. Thoughts on what the weapon portends are many and varied. Some consider it the mark of a great sin, or a sign of great devastation. Some think of it as the end of an age, while others the beginning. You are the one who brought the beginning of a new age, depending on which ending you chose, but all thanks to Marika guiding you the whole way allowing you to choose how the world should be, and of course, to our dedicated smith. He may not remember us, but we will never forget him. Thank you everyone so much for waiting while I got this Hugo Lore play ready. Really, really hope you enjoyed. Thank you everyone. Thank you to all of the new subscribers I recently got. So thank you again, Vati, for featuring me in your latest video. And welcome everyone. I really hope you enjoy your time here. Please let me know your thoughts on Hugh's ending and the endings in general as well. And also thank you to my channel members and patrons. Razors 5, Jawbite, Carl Coldwell, Hellborn Hero, Ratoyo, Exile Turtle, Bloodfallen 223, Jeremy, Monkaru, Kichu, Jafrakano, Nubis, Chase, Justnick, Kevin H, Tagalon Dahl, Tabris, Jonathan Spiris, Milo Raglan, Frankie Felix, Dark Souls Weeb, Daunted 232, Echo San Beach, Joachim Westman, STK True, Lua 420HZ, Kacharadon Zastra, Delanator90, Meske, Vinicius Anajo Lego, Trip Kennedy, Frozen Over, Matthew, Gothreaper, Tim, 
Judson, Lone Wolf, Joey Vision, Omni Rainbow, Merch Cross Cooper, Foam, Lord Glacier, Garrulous Goldmask, True Fenrir, Cross Hegan, Crystal Blue Persuasion, JC. Reign of Pain, Andrew Haynes, Akura, Justice for Adan, J Dub, S Keith 001, Can I Win Please, Chango Bob, Fallen Mind, Mr. Axan, Raglan Strom, Vincent E. M. Thorne, Cheskimo, Nox Camellius, Julie, David Matteson, Chris Ritson, Mug, Law Lover, Marco Rush, Roxy Zeppeli, Levante Truss, Charlotte 96, Mr. H, Shamrock 219, Dan Dingley, Tech Tesla, E Does, Dylan Schnabel, Bugboy 001, Rashida May Shoin, Arlen Needy, PhD Cola, Hiragi, Joshua Waite, Drew Lighthead, Kevin Culkins, Kalmar, Mark Sharon, Rathsponge, Frexian Sleeper Asian, Alex, Raz, Emma, Jack Simpson, Gaping Donut, Jacob Thu, Fancy Pants Pikachu, E.T., Anthony Manzano, Twig, Caleb Sadlowski, Art888, McPlatypus, MedBJ, Mahit Mahanti, Elusive Oni, Psych Seal, Abyss Walker 26, Jordan, Bob Lee, Nick Nugent, Mark Coswitch, Rhett Martin, Deary Blossy Laxi, S. Majus, J. Gabriel Ronkainen, Tom Hallam, Vern, Ryan Brown, Orlando, Jack Manson, Pepperoni Oni, Jokai, Chef Whiskey, Ruben Espino, Ali Almari, Cross Hegan, Fitz, Camille Rodon, Jordan N, Fabio Walter, Corwin0125, Crack for Turtles, Blastmeister, Hermes, Lady Canobia, JC Burdoin, Orlando Villabos, Ola Angelsmark, Luis Can Luis Cantado, and Robert Bell. Thank you everyone so much. <laughs>